Good morning, ladies, and welcome to the first of three installments of Megillus Rus. And um, I hope we will get new inspiration from Megillus Rus. We have to learn from her because this is a good way for us to approach the holy holiday of Shavuos, which is upcoming. And we will learn from her because there's many things. We find the Ramah says in Orachayim, he says, we read Rus on Shavuos because she became the great grandmother of David Amelech, who was born and died on Shavuos. Um, also, Rus is the numeric value, Gematria 606, which are the 606 commandments she accepted. We on Shavuos are all like converts, and we affirm our faith in the Torah and our love for the Torah. And that's the reason why, two reasons why we read Megillus Rus on Shavuos. Uh, Rus was written by Shmuel Hanavi. He composed uh, the say, you know, Megillus Rus. And um, there are many lessons derived, and hopefully we'll go into many of them. I'm using heavily um, a safer called Shashuim Moed that came out that's quite, that's Mamish, uh, a beautiful parish on Megillus Rus. Rav Chaim Rennert wrote this parish. I'm also, he brings down from a lot of sources, from the al the from Malbim and other places. And I, it was very helpful to use this. So three sessions, I hope you have your Megillahs handy because we're gonna show how there's never an extraneous word in Tanakh. The Torah is even more, and every letter is measured. But here too, although this is just Navi, which is not like a direct uh, revelation from like Moshe Rabbeinu directly speaking, God speaking out of his mouth, these, every word written is very concise because it teaches us great lessons. Now, the, um, you know, in general, there's something, there's two big lessons we learned from Megillus Rus. The al Kaddish tells us that people think that um, they, they think that, you know, the whole story surrounding Mashiach is very bizarre. You know, all the strange events in Torah that you have to be careful to explain properly to a class, that's all the yichus, the background of Mashiach. You know, a uh, very murky background. Why? One reason is that Mashiach is going to lift the lowest neshamas and bring, you know, he's there for everyone, not just for the ho ho holy and glorified, but for the common man as well. That's what Mashiach is there for. There's another reason too, but let's, let's analyze some of the, the let's see where it begins. Okay, the first relationship that brought upon Mashiach was the relationship between the daughters of Lot and their father, which is not such a great one. You know, they thought the world was coming to an end and they felt they had to procreate. So the first one had the audacity to call him Moab, which means Ma'av, from my father. The second one says, Amon, I'm like a nation, you know, like they didn't, they weren't as, but Moab is the one where Rus comes from and where David Amalek comes from. Later on, we find two sisters, which uh, is not allowed after the giving of the Torah, but two sisters marry Yaakov. Then we find Tamar with her thing, the whole fling with Yehuda, which again, any of these incidents can be analyzed properly and we'll see that they were really meant for the right reasons. It just, we don't have time to go into them because that would take us hours. David and Bathsheba, Rus and Boaz, all these great relationships we're all leading up to Mashiach. Why? The reason is that we're supposed to learn, says the al from this Megillah, that action, especially Mashiach, you have to be for the sake of heaven. And you know when it's the most obvious that you're doing something for the sake of heaven? When things don't look so good. When you don't see satisfaction necessarily, you don't see an outcome. You know, we live in a society today very into the externals. How do things look? You know, in America, they have to have minority races be in the cabinet or the Senate, the whatever, the, all the advisors, all the everything have to be minority members because it looks like you're being on it. But looks aren't everything. The main thing is what's inside your heart. That's what counts. And the way to judge if somebody's really for the sake of heaven is how does a person act behind closed doors or when the chips are down? or when things don't look so normal. So Mashiach can never take full pride and say, look who I came from. He came from the most murkiest relationships in Tanakh that have pages and pages of explanation in order that we don't get the wrong impression. 
I remember once teaching a group of irreligious ladies years ago. Uh, I don't remember what topic it was, but whatever topic it was, somebody pipes up and says, King David, he was a lustful man. Now, King David wrote to Hillam. Our whole sitter is based on King David. So obviously, what if you read things without Mephorshim, without commentaries, it looks like our some of our forefathers were terrible. Rev Dessler mentions that the sins of our forefathers were so minute that the only ones they ever sinned with were mentioned in Tanakh. Otherwise, they didn't sin their entire lives, which is pretty heavy duty, pretty great. And even when you read the commentaries, you see how could he be mentioned in the Holy Torah if you did these horrible, horrible sins? <coughs> now, we find there's another lesson in the Megillah of Rus. The Medrash Rus tells us, Amar of Zera, of Zera tells us, Megillah zu enla enbalo tuma velo tara. This Megillah doesn't teach us any laws of purity or impurity, lo iser velo heter, no laws of what's allowed and what's not allowed. So why was it written? What are we getting from Megillus Rus? To teach us the great reward for people that do acts of kindness. Now, the acts of kindness, what kind of chesed is there? Well, we find Boaz doing all this chesed with, with all the poor in his field, and especially with Rus. And even marrying her, he was an old man, though he had to go through to prove that a Moabite woman is allowed uh, to claw Yisrael is a whole big deal to prove, and he had to go through all that. Russ's thing, she didn't leave her mother-in-law, Naomi, and her whole thing that she, she's willing to you know, cling to Hashem, and that's the ultimate chesed, to give up everything of your own for a, a higher purpose. Rabbi Rottenberg, Shlita, brings down, it looks like it's a contradiction in terms, but he mentions the ultimate kindness is having good intentions. Because what is kindness? Acts of kindness means that you're doing something because you're thinking outside of yourself. Because that's what chesed is. Chesed is not thinking about yourself, thinking about the other. And only with a, a person with the trait of kindness is, uh, is able to fully embrace, let's say, emunah and bitachan. People are all talking today, emunah and bitachan. But number one building block before you have emunah and bitachan is a person needs to work on thinking about things outside of themselves or responsibility before rights, before entitlement, thinking outside of what is coming to me. That is how a person becomes a holy person, you know, because that's what your neshama is. Your neshama wants you to be, to divest yourself of physicality. So we're allowed to eat. We're allowed to sleep. We're allowed to be married. We're allowed to enjoy life. So what does it mean divesting yourself of physicality? Not making yourself the main thing in life, getting rid of yourself. That's the, that's the ultimate. And, um, you know, so, so that's, what, that's what we are. So for being for the sake of heaven, which is despite the murky background of Mashiach, that's when we know if somebody's for the sake of heaven. No matter if no one notices, no one appreciates, no one, it doesn't look like you did anything monumental. In fact, sometimes it looks like it's downright wrong, like the daughters of Lot. I just read something in passing, which is really incredible. They said, Reb Moshe Feinstein, Zatzal, Reb Pam brings this down. Reb Moshe Feinstein once met uh, a man from his town in, in Russia, Luban, I believe it was called. And the man was on his deathbed. And he said, it always bothered him. How could these daughters of Lope be written in the Torah for what they did with their father? And he said that on his deathbed, two distinguished women came before him and they told him, we did this. So later, when the Christian belief will come and say that somebody was born without a father, here were girls that could really have said, ah, you know, we just had a Holy Spirit and that's how we had these children. They were willing to forgo that because they foresaw that there would be a Christianity and they were willing to admit to, who, to whom the child belongs. Why wasn't this other woman willing to admit to whom her child belonged? That's incredible. I don't know, but that's what this man told her, Misha. So it was interesting. But the point is, in any case, it's still something that looks really bad. But all of that combined with the Megillah is only of chesed. Chesed is really in doing. Sometimes you're not even appreciated. That, that is also tied in. The biggest chesed is to do things that are not appreciated. To do things for the, 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 the higher, the lower the people you're dealing with, 
the higher the chesed. You're not doing it for your best friends who came for dinner. You're doing it for somebody who really, you know, whatever, not, you're just doing, the more you do things for people that drive you crazy, the more reward you get because it's something that it's not obvious. You're doing it more for the sake of heaven. And guess what? If it's your own family, when you for sure don't feel it's the chesed, that's the biggest chesed sometimes. The Sifzei Chaim brings down a medrash that when Moshe Rabbeinu got the Torah, um, Hashem made him look like Avram Avinu. What difference does it make who he look like? And it says there was a dialogue that went on and the Malachim said, what we should give the, to- you should give the Torah to human beings. Look how lowly they are. We're goody goodies. We say, holy, holy, holy all day. And what do you say? You know, you people are low lives. You're running after Yetzirah. Sometimes you're not doing the right thing. So Hashem says, look at his face. Don't you remember this man that fed you when you were, when you were angels posing as human beings and he took care of you? What does that medrash mean? Says Asif Sechaim, when a person like Avram Avinu gave to supposedly lowly people, just coming in, idol worshipers, he gave them a meal. What he was saying was a human being can transcend angels. Angels just do their instinct, which is to do good all the time. But a human being uses his free will when he could easily choose the wrong path and he goes and helps others, even the lowliest of others, that shows the greatness. And that was what Avram Avinu epitomized, giving and giving and giving. And Hashem felt this was the representative of the Jewish people that he wanted to show to the angels, how we make choices every moment, every living moment, we're making choices of what to think about and where our, our kavana should be. And even when it's murky, we get double, triple schar, even more a reward. Um, some, some people say you get a hundred times more reward when it's out of difficulties, because then you're demonstrating that you're outside of yourself and your, your feelings, your thoughts are really for the sake of heaven. Now, there's another idea that Sifzachim brings down a lot. You know, we call the holiday that's upcoming Kabbalah Satorah the receiving of the Torah. Why do we call it by that name? Why don't we call it the giving of the Torah? That's what Hashem gave the Torah. Why is it? Re- well, well, we are the recipients, that's true. But Tzif Zechaim says to be a recipient, you have to be, let's say, if you want to catch a ball, you have to make sure your hands are free and empty. You have to wear proper mitt, right? You have to have proper uh, uh, you know, glove to be able to catch that ball properly. So too, if we want to accept the Torah, we have to make ourselves a fitting vessel. We have to be someone worthy of getting the Torah. And how is that? By ridding yourself of ego, by making yourself empty so you'll be able to absorb all that Torah and emptying yourself of the physicality. The first step is thinking of the other. We mentioned that before in previous classes, we're talking about like uh, holiness just means to really make yourself for others. And that's the best way to absorb holiness. Okay, so let's start the Megillah with this. We're in the first chapter. There are four chapters. We hope to finish the first today, maybe tiptoe into the second, because today we had an introduction, a grand introduction, and we will do next week chapter two and part of three, and then the last one we'll do three and, and four. Okay, now, let, we're taking every word. Uh, in Hebrew, vayihi, all the time, whenever the vayihi and it was, it could be, you could just translate it and it was, but we are always told that va, vav is usually an attachment, that the, it's not, and it was, it's not, it was, but, and it was. So there's something horrific that happens. We have from tradition that it means it was very hard times. You know, that's, we learned from the Anshik Nessus Agdola. It was the time of the judging of the judges. By he rav ba'aris, and there became a famine in the land. Now, shvot has shoftim, the judging of the judges. So there's there's several different meanings to this. It's either one of two. One is oil adorish is shofet is shoftehem. Woe be to the generation that judge their judges. It means when a judge would proclaim a judgment. You know, this is in a basin or something. They would come out. There's a there's a dispute between monetary dispute or something. And, and the people would come and say, oh yeah, look at you. You know, like they would not accept the judgment of their judge, judges. So that's already why things were bad. It's connecting us. Why was there a famine? Because people were not giving proper respect to their leaders. 
And woe to it that they have should have these type of judges judging. The judge, uh, so two opinions really. One is, um, well, the, Ebenezer says the famine was because of this. And Rashi says they were guilty because they, um, the, the people, the, the judges were, either the judges were corrupt or the people judged their judges. It could be connected together because when people saw how corrupt the judges were, they were starting to judge the judges. So it's all that together. But, um, but we can, you know, it says in, um, in the Medrash, if you curse your judges, it's like cursing your own grain. Very bad to get into trouble with Rabbanim, you know, to not to say bad words about Talmidei Chachamim because, you know, people can have major damage. Maybe you heard years and years ago, the famous story about Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Zechot Tzadik Lebracha, and grasshoppers. So Rav Chaim Kanievsky, you know, was a whole, there was a whole miracle story that um, he, had, he wrote a whole uh, safer about uh, kashrut of, of certain grasshoppers and locusts because the Yemenites have a tradition to eat them. And rather than to lose this, uh, this thing, this tradition from thousands of years, Rav Chaim checked out all types of grasshoppers and analyzed each one of them. One time he could not find a certain grasshopper. He wasn't sure how it looked and Hashem made it land right near him on his ledge, I believe of his window or on his desk. I don't remember exactly. And he looked at it and it came, right? It was, an, it was a rare type of grasshopper. And then he um, had one more detail he forgot and the thing landed again and he was able to correct it. So apparently there was somebody in his time that scoffed at the whole thing saying, oh, come on, you think these kind of things happen? The person was infested with grasshoppers in his house and they had to have exterminator and it didn't go away. And they said, maybe you insulted the God al Hador, you insulted the greatest rabbi in the generation, Rab Chaim. And he asked his forgiveness and then that plague of grasshoppers ended. But that's a true story in our day. There's many other such stories to, to, to hurt a Talmud Chacham, a Torah scholar is really severe and we have to be careful not to judge our judges. They know much more than we do. Now, not saying that there isn't corruption, What's really incredible is that this is hundreds of years from the giving of the Torah, a mere hundreds of years. This is the judges. Now, what period of the judges? Some people say the time of Devorah and Barak. Some people say it was Ivtsan, was Boaz. Some people say Shamgar and Ehud. Who knows what's the beginning or end? This whole period of the judges, uh, it's after Joshua. So, you know, and then there were some leaders, great leaders in between uh, Yoshua and the Shoftim. So it could be hundreds of years, but still, you know, after giving the Torah, this corruption with judges. Now, these most commentaries say these were not the greatest rabbis of the generation. They were minor judges, but still a man learning Torah. How can you be corrupt? And also, how can the people have such lack of regard for their leaders when such a thing is going on? Okay, so there was a famine. Ba'aretz. According to the Rav Shlema al kabatz who was the Talmud of the, or the Mechavrusa of the Arizal, who wrote the Chadodi, he said this Rav, this famine only hit Israel. And um, that's why we're going to see Ali Melech is going to leave the country. Um, the Yaivet says that there was a famine in other places as well. And, um, but Israel was hit harder, or, you know, it, it was also hit, but he felt We'll see in a minute why Elimelech decides to leave. Now, there were 10 famines in Tanakh, and I'm not going to have time to go into them. But if you look at Bereshis Rabba Chaf Hei Gimel, it tells you 10 places in, in Tanakh where there were famines. And the last famine is going to be the days of Mashiach. Some people say there's some kind of medrash that says that during the Shemitah year or right after the Shemitah year, there's going to be a famine and then Mashiach will come. So we are in Shemitah right now. And we do have problems right now with food. Let's hope Hashem gives us the most minute and just be the baby formula. And we should be able to send from Canada to the States. And the um, Panavish Rav says, the famine is not going to be for bread because uh, the famine will be with people thirsting for Torah. And the Panavish Rav says, that's not so great. That means it's going to be such a lack of Torah that people are thirsting for it. Other people disagree with his interpretation and say that people will just be on a spiritual vein and will be thirsting for Torah for itself. Now, so um, 
now what happened? So there was a rav in the land, Vayelech Ish Mi Beis Lechem, and a man left. Whenever Ish is your, used, the word Ish means man, but anytime it's used in Tanakh, it means an important person. We have a precedent, Ish in um, Parsha of Shmos. It says a man from Beis Levi, uh, Ish Mi Beis Levi, which was Am, um, Amram. And he, and he took a woman from Beis Levi that was Yechevet. So these were important people. Ish always means Ish Yehudi Haya in Megillus Esther. Ish means an important person um, from Beis Lechem Yehuda. Now Beis Lechem were, you know, these are the, the tribe of Yehuda was the most, those the tribe from, for Mashiach, for David. And Beis Lechem is uh, the, probably one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious family from Yehuda. He, a man went, Lagur Ba'eretz Moav. He went to Bistei Moav. Hu v'ishto u'shnei vanav. He went to live in the fields of Moav, he and his wife and his two sons. Now, each word says something. Now, he was an important person. He left Beis Lechem Yehuda. Now, why did he leave? So there was, uh, there was a downturn in the economy. And it says, Ish, he wasn't only a prestigious man, Ish, an important man. They said a very, the greatest rabbi in the, probably in the generation. Um, he also was, according to most of the commentaries, he was a very big um, philanthropist. He was the Rothschild of the generation. He was the philanthropist. And what he did wrong was he abandoned his people. Now, Many people offered different explanations. Perhaps they felt, I'm going to have a million people knocking at my door. I'm not going to be able to learn a word of Torah. Like, you know, maybe he thought that. Um, first it says, ish, and then he went to live. And then he and his wife is mentioned at the end of the verse to tell us, Malbim says, he went alone at first. They didn't want to go with him. They didn't want to leave Israel. It's not so simple to go leave Israel. You know, if once you live in Israel to leave Eretz Yisrael, it's a holy place. How can you go down unless it's a question of now people left Israel before Avram Avinu left. There was a rob. There was a famine. He left Israel. But this person, everyone depended on him and it was going to cause a great amount of depression and anxiety in the populace because he was the man that was like there for everybody. And all of a sudden he's abandoning them. Now he had all kinds of ulterior motives. He was saying to himself, you know, you know that uh, you know he meant well, and he just felt it's going to be a big bother and a big problem. And how is he going to handle it? He felt overwhelmed, and there are going to be a lot of complainers and everything else. But we're told by the medrash that he had sorus ayin, that there was something down deep, deep, deep inside a motive, this little bit of selfishness. He did not want to share. There was some. Uh, stinginess that he didn't want to give these people. And that's one of the main thing down deep. He didn't even realize of this, this motive he had, but um, he felt that's why he's leaving. Many people give all kinds of messianic. Eli Melech means a lie to Boha Malchus. From him, they thought would come Mashiach. Like he's from the right family, the right branch of the family, everything. And yet, you know, look what happened. So he had even a great person you know, can make a mistake. And he made a, it was a huge mistake for him. Now, um, you know, now, now he, you know, what happened? He goes, um, Lagur, Lagur means to live, but it, it's similar to the word gare, which means stranger. A gare just means you came from a strange place. You came from somewhere else doesn't mean you are strange or weird. Does, that's not the sense of ger. Ger means something that's um, temporary. Lagur means to dwell somewhere temporarily. You don't really belong there initially. You're not one of those people, but you are there. Now, in the sense of living, it means temporary living because otherwise you are not from there. So you, you know, it means you're a stranger. It also could mean plain stranger. So when we have a gear, that means they were, it's a mitzvah for us to welcome the, the gear. In other words, they feel like they're strangers. I know some converts that still till today feel like they, they don't belong. It's unfortunate. We have to work on making them belong. I also know a convert who used to always talk about that her other converts were her sisters, 
we're supposed to feel a convert is a Jew and they're our sister and they're closer to Avram and Sarah than we are. And we should give them the respect they deserve. You know, otherwise people, you know, they're not a stranger. Once a person converts, they are a full-fledged Jew. Moshe Rabbeinu married a convert. Rabbi Akiva was a descendant of converts. Rachav, who was more than just a convert, married Yoshua. I mean, there are many, many, many examples of people in Tanakh that married converts. And we have nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with the converts as long as the based in was kosher and everything's kosher. They're holy people. And we're told six times in the Torah, you have to be careful of the feelings of a convert because they feel naturally like a stranger, but they're not a stranger. I'll never forget one time I had to go into a room. Oh, no, no, not me. It wasn't about me. Sorry. I know somebody who was a female therapist. She told me this story. A female therapist had to go in a room. There was a meeting between rabbis and therapists about whatever it was, something going on in the Jewish community. And this woman like walked in at first, a little bit uncomfortable. It's all men in the room. And Rabbi Kirsner, he should rest in peace. Such a special person. He right away welcomed her and he made her feel very comfortable. So she shouldn't feel odd at all. You know, so that, that's, you know. So here they went to live temporarily in, um, he wanted to live in Moab. He didn't want to go there for sure. He wanted to go back to Eretz Yisrael because he felt it was a temporary measure. And it says in the fields of Moab, fields, plural, why fields? He didn't even stay in one place for a long time and he didn't go into cities. He didn't want to be influenced by the people of Moab. Moab was known, P.S., for their stinginess. Now, how coincidental was that, you know? So this is the, why this whole thing had to happen this way, because he had a certain degree of stinginess. You're never allowed to accept a male convert from Moab because they didn't, the Jews offered to pay them to go through their land just for some water and bread when they were on their way uh, to, to Eretz Israel. They refused to do that for them. So forever, because of their bad traits, because you have to have kindness, and that was cruelty, they, we are never allowed to marry a Moabite convert forever, never. Uh, Ammon and Moab are never allowed to enter the Jewish people. Now, um, I'm, I'm sorry, we're, yeah, they're never allowed to become converts. We'll talk about this. But here, uh, we're to, we learn a lesson from this, says Rav Chaim Renner, Shlita. He says, if a person's given a talent, and he runs away because of difficulties. Hashem is testing him, telling him, this is your purpose. Hold on and get the world to come. Now, this everyone asked to ask their local rabbi, but there were many, many, many rabbis during World War II that did not abandon their flock. And they could have saved their lives. One was Rav Hanan Wasserman, who actually went back to Europe to get killed. He was collecting in America. And he went back to Europe because he didn't want to abandon his, his community who were depending on him. And um, he was murdered in the case. Sometimes we are told to leave. I don't know each case we have to ask, but we find that there are um, even, even th people like the Chavetz Chaim, the Briskorov, during times when people were suffering, they would not sleep on a bed. I think the Briskorov and the Chavetz Chaim both did not sleep in a bed during World War I. People are suffering. How can I sleep in a bed? This is feeling for the community, not saying it just run away and make my life a little bit easier. Now, I'm sure there were, it was minutiae we're talking about to the, anyone, he'd look like somebody that didn't sin. He was a very esteemed scholar, but something in him, he was too quick to save his own skin. A leader of a community has responsibilities. And if we have any talent, we should offer them for the community. That's why God endowed us with talents. We're supposed to use them for proper reasons. I remember in the beginning of, right before COVID, I heard an amazing story in the Ated that there was a person in Muncie who one morning got up before davening, he was on his way to davening, he stops into this local, I think it's, there's, there's a gas station in Muncie that sells like danishes and food. And that, now they have that in Lakewood all over the place, aisle nine, I believe it's called in Lakewood. Anyways, so um, he goes to this gas station and he never, before davening to go buy a danish, he had a few, so the, the man asked him, what, what, what's today they are buying a danish before davening? And he said to him, he said, um, well, I have to run right after shul today, and I haven't eaten a Danish for many, many years. My favorite was, I think, I forgot it was a cinnamon Danish or chocolate Danish, whatever it was. I haven't eaten Danish since 
where Rabbi Rubashkin was incarcerated. I told myself, I'm not going to eat a Danish as long as this man is suffering. And when he comes out, that's when I'm going to allow myself a Danish. Look at that greatness to feel for the community and to think of others. And this is what they were missing. And that feeling of not thinking of others. We said the whole purpose of Megillus Rus, that one of the prerequisites for getting the Torah is to think of others and to be there for others. You know, so this temporary thing that he did was still... Uh, not caring about the community. Okay, his wife is mentioned after him. They say Nomi was not taken to task according to some of the commentaries because she was just trying to be a good wife. He wanted her to come, she came. She didn't, she wasn't necessarily in agreement with him that this was the right move to make and her sons as well, initially. Um, you know, it's very important that, you know, like Rabbi Friedler, he should rest in peace, was the Rashiva of Neri Sralf, Toronto. I remember one time I had an appointment with him and I came into a study and he was on the phone with somebody and he, his eyes were closed shut and he was on the phone. He said, Mr. Jacobs, I'm thinking of you. I want you to have Rafua Shalema. You know, here he was, you know, like trying to empathize and really feel for another Jew. And that's what we're supposed to work on. We're all different, coming from different places and it's hard to feel that thing. But no say, but Olam Haver is one of the 48 ways to wisdom to become, to deserve the Torahs. We have to feel for other Jews. We have to put them in our minds, especially if they're in a different situation than us. It's hard to empathize. We can usually think about people like us, but we still you know, have to put ourselves in another person's place. Now, when they left Eretz Yisrael, the Gemara and Ksubis tells us, Tana Rabbanan, our rabbis teach us, Le'olam yadar adam be'eretz Yisrael. A man should forever try, endeavor to live in Eretz Yisrael. Not only did he leave his people, he left the land of Israel. And sometimes we forget, we get busy with life, but a person is always supposed to try to live in Eretz Yisrael. It's a rabbinic question. Mind you, you should ask your rabbi or a great rabbi. The, Chaz, uh, the uh, Rav Shach Zetzal was against people moving to Israel in his day. He felt that, um, that, you know, we have enough people poor over there. We don't need more people. If you can't manage financially, you shouldn't go there. But there's ra different rabbis today and there's different situations. Some people have reasons to be where they are for elderly parents or whatever it is. People have reasons. But every once in a while, we have to entertain ourselves with that question. You should even live in a city in Israel where most people are idolaters. And don't live in Chutzlars. It's Gemarak Subas. And even in Lakewood, a city which is mostly Jews, it's better to live in Aloka. Anyone who lives in Israel is like a person who has a God. And whoever lives outside of Israel is like a person who doesn't have a God. So to that extent, we have to endeavor to try, if we can, to live in the land of Israel. Now, what happens? And so now they, they get their in Moab. And Shem Ha'ish Elimelech, we're told his name now, that he would, he would say that from me is going to come Mashiach now, or kingship. Now, that is, you know, on, on one hand, that you should tell yourself, I, have, I come from great stock. Yosef told himself all that thing, so you shouldn't come to sin. Tell yourself, look, I don't want to ruin all the previous generations, but perhaps there was a, a drop of arrogance there, and that's why he slipped up and didn't notice that perhaps he's not thinking of enough for others. Now, um, now he, by the way, listen, his yichas, he, his wife is named Naomi. Naomi means, means pleasantness because she was, uh, she had pleasant deeds, good midos. And his two sons were Machlon and Bechilion. Now, just to backtrack for a minute, uh, Elimelech was the son of Nachshon ben Aminadav. Um, Nachshon was the, um, he, he, you know, Nachshon was the one that jumped into the, the Yamsuf, the Red Sea, and then it split. He was the first one to be brave enough. And his son was, was him. He had two brothers, he had three brothers, the father of Naomi. So Naomi was his niece, Plone Almoni, later we'll see, and Salmon, three, three brothers he had. Those are all sons of Nachshon ben Aminadav. Now, even if you have the best yichas and the best background, it doesn't help once you leave Eretz Yisrael. Also, if you disconnect from the community, you don't have 
the merit of the community. We all need to belong to a community. Now, machlon and kilyam. Machlon could mean uh, that nimche, um, that he was wiped off. Kilyam means he was totally destroyed. Um, but machlon could also mean he was forgiven. They say Kilion was the first person to marry a Moabite woman. He initiated, so his act was worse. And also perhaps Mahlon did tshuva, like he regretted that he did such a thing. They were Ephrasim. Ephrasim means were prominent people from Beis Lechem, Yehuda, and they went and to the fields of Moab and they were there. Were there means it became a little bit more permanent. The Malbim said first, then they went to the cities. Uh, first, you know, and they and they stayed there. And uh, the argument by Yusham, they became one with the people and she was left with her two sons. So we're told by the Mephorshim, um, first of all, we're told, Shuv Yom Echad Lifnei Misaska, it says in Pirkei Avis, chapter two, verse uh, Mishnah Vav, a person does not know the end of his days. So return right before you die. We never know every morning whether we're going to get every night when we go to sleep, whether we're going to wake up the next morning, right? So here he thought, I'll be in Moab. I'll come back to Eretz Yisrael. All will be good. Never made it back. We don't know. It's a lesson for us when we go on vacation. You know, some people think vacation, you can like lower, be a little lax, lower your standards. You're not at home. But we have to realize, no matter where we are, that we have to keep the same found, fundamental aspects of Judaism. A person does not know where his last moments will be, and we want to die with tshuva. So it's very important, no matter where, we have, to, we have to have good thoughts, and where will we be at our last moment? So we want to make those places good places and places of growth. We always have to grow, no matter where we are. Okay, Bayamas Elimelech. Uh, when he passed away, we find that um, that when he passes away, that we find Vatisha Er He, she was left alone. We're told she was the only one at the funeral. Her daughters-in-law had to pay for the funeral. This is the wealthiest woman in Beis Lechem, loses her husband. She's in a strange land. And she ends up with nothing. So there is Ish um, Naomi, because it says, Ein Adameis Elo Ishto. A person primarily dies for his spouse. Nobody misses somebody as much as a spouse. Ein Ish Meis Elo Ishto. So, um, so we have to appreciate the spouse. They're the ones that feel for us the most. Vatisha Air, and she felt she was left. She felt like Shirayim, like leftovers, we're told. Now, as soon as he passes away, then they marry these strange Moabite women. For one's name is Orpa, the second one's name is Rus. Nashi Moavios. Now, there's a machlokas um, by Yisu Lahem. According to one explanation, not for the sake of heaven, for them. It was like self-centered. They weren't thinking of Hashem enough. They married Moabite women. According to some people, it was actual Moabite women that were not converted, but there are other, and, you know, and there are other people, there are other opinions. I think it's called the Bayes Chadash, the Bach, who feels in the times of David Shlomo and perhaps even in the Shoftim, the Jews were to some degree very, they still people were very respected people. So everybody wanted to convert. They were not accepting converts. Basically, they were not accepting converts. And that's why it says, hurry up and convert, because when Mashiach will come, they will no longer be accepting converts because it's a popular thing to do to be a Jew. And it's not, look what happened with the Arab Rav. They were, were all converts that converted for the wrong reasons because, you know, it looked like you're on the right team to be a Jew and sinned in the time of the Midbar. But um, of course, if a person is a righteous convert, there's no one better than a righteous convert. But here in the time of Shlomo, David, and also some people say in the Shoftim's time, they had these small bate dins, small base dins throughout the country, not the major base dins, but small base dins would in some situations convert these women with 
um, conditionally. If anything goes wrong and later we find out that these people were not sincere, retroactively, the entire conversion is no longer good. By the way, I had a convert once after September 11th, she called me frantically. She was in the process of conversion and she calls me frantically saying that, um, is her conversion still gonna be accepted because now Mashiach is coming. She thought Mashiach was on its way. And we checked with the base and they said, yes, if you're in, already in the process of conversion, you will be accepted even when Mashiach comes. Any case, so they married. So either they were converted, but on a condition or they, they were not converted. They married, but even if they were on condition, like why couldn't they have married Jewish girls? Such a prestigious family. Not that there's anything wrong with converts, but they converted them for marriage in this case. There is a heter for today. A lot of people wonder when they hear why are converts um, converting because there's a boy, a, a guy that's a husband. Revel Yashiv Zatzal Paskind, when there's a serious marriage and let's say the guy's becoming more religious, and he's never gonna divorce this woman, then we should convert the woman because of the man. Otherwise we lose his whole family, his whole offspring. So um, in that case, it is a mitzvah to convert the wife. If it's, but of course she has to go through the whole arduous process. We, it's here in Toronto, it's at least a year. In other countries, it's at least two years. I mean, England, let's say, um, you know, it's, it's a heavy process to find out whether they really are uh, sincere. And the reason they make it so hard is because it is easy. And people do want to be a Jew today as good. You know, people think the Jews are better people and et cetera, et cetera, and all that. So, you know, they want to make sure that people will be sincere. So if they convert and the base sin feels responsible that they won't come to sin as a Jew, like why do we need Jews that are going to sin? Because they're going to suffer. Their souls are going to suffer once they convert. So instead, the base didn't wants to help them out and decide if they're really sincere so they'll be proper Jews afterwards. Now, the two names, Rus, um, like we said, is 606, the Gematria. Also, Tor, a, a, a pure dove, has the same letters as Rus. Orpa means the back of the neck, Oref, which means she ultimately turns her back on the mother-in-law and leaves Judaism. But she, um, they both of the daughters, they were princesses. They were the daughters of Eglon, the king of Moab, who Ehud ben Gera once told him, I have something from the king to tell you, from Hashem to tell you. And uh, Eglon stood up when he heard the name of God. And in that merit, he had these two daughters, it's it, which teaches us something. You know, sometimes we have to get up for Kaddish and Kedusha, everything. It's not easy. Look, here's a man he merited to have Mashiach coming from him, a king of Moab, because he stood up when they mentioned Hashem's name. So we should have more alacrity when we have to stand up and mention Hashem's name too. Okay, now they, uh, they lived in Moab ten, like 10 years. Look how many years Hashem waits for them to do tshuva. Hashem is uber patient, more patient than we are. When we feel like we're getting impatient with somebody, just think how patient Hashem is with us with our sins. Any case, they lived there 10 whole years. And then by Yamusu Gam Shnehem, Pasuk Hay, they both died. Machlon Vechilion. Now, when it says they both died, there's a, we're told that perhaps she lost, she had a miscarriage, Naomi. She lost a child born to her and Elimelech and Moab. So maybe she lost really three children altogether. Um, or it could mean Gam, also, why is it also mentioned? First, God did what he did to Job, Eov. He took away all their money. And then he made things difficult. Then he took away her husband. And, you know, they still didn't get the drift. You don't leave Eretz Yisrael. You have to go back to it. What Nomi did wrong was um, maybe she could have encouraged her husband more about Israel. She had to obey him. That's true. She had to, you know, she couldn't like make a whole fight with him. But maybe she should have protested a little bit. And definitely what she did wrong was she did not protest that her sons were marrying Moabite women. So again, there's nothing wrong with wearing convert, but these were people like they converted them once that they were looked, they took Moabite women and converted them. And they, you know, which was, you know, they're kosher converts, but why when there's so many Jewish women, are you going and trying to find yourself a non-Jew, you know, and, and maybe the conversion will be successful, maybe not, you know? 
if it's already someone's in a relationship, it's another whole story. But before the relationship to do this, a little bit of a problem. Now it says, um, okay, so they both died. So now, Batisha um, Er Haisha, and the woman was left alone. We're told Rabbi Renard says something. It says when, when her children died, she again revisited the trauma of losing her husband. You know, I, it says in the Chumash, this is my thought, but it's, I read this somewhere many years ago. It says, um, you know, not supposed to afflict a ger or an almana or a yasom. You're not allowed to hurt an orphan, a widow, a poor person, anyone that has a hardship. It could be a handicapped person, anyone that has that's feeble or weak or vulnerable because ki'im sa'okitsakelai, when they scream to me. So the Meforshim say it's a sa'okitsak, scream twice. Why is it, okay, you could say it's for emphasis, but why it says, if they will scream, scream to me. Why is it mentioned twice? So we're told by the commentaries that when a person is afflicted and it's like a widow, for example, every time she's afflicted, she says, and you know why they're picking on me? Because I'm a widow. So it revisits her former trauma of her husband leaving her all alone. And she feels again all alone. So this was not only just losing her children, but feeling again, like raw pain, just like she felt when she lost her husband. Mishne Yeladeha, they're called her children. Now, why not Baneha, usually her sons? They're not Yeladim, they're not children. They were married men. Why were they called Yeladeha? Because they were barren. They didn't have any children. So it's like she had nobody, like just like losing small children. Okay, with no progeny. Now, Batakam he, and she got up. Bechalo Seha and her daughters-in-law, and she returned from the Sede Moab. Now, this is a big moment. She got up. Why are we saying she got up? Here, she, she did not let it. Now she felt, I can't tarry one more minute here. I have to immediately get. She was planning to move immediately without her daughters-in-law even. She didn't want to go buy parties. She didn't want any kind of anything. She felt, I cannot I cannot wait one minute. I have to do tshuva immediately. But says Batasha, if she returned, means tshuva, but also returning physically to the land of Israel. She felt that was her sin. She can no longer, she has to change her ways. And that's really amazing. You know, that shows that the human condition, we can get up and you have to do tshuva immediately. Um, you know, and that says, um, and she and her daughters-in-law, they maybe had a different feeling originally. She wanted to go back to Eretz Yisrael. They felt maybe, and also because of her mazel. It says, you know, Mishana Makal, Mishana Mazel, you change your place, you change your, your uh, luck, so to speak. And her daughters-in-law perhaps just felt we got to get out of here. We have a, we, all these terrible things are happening to us and we have to leave as well. Now she heard in the fields of Moab that Hashem remembered his people and he was, they were again, the famine is over. So she said, I'm leaving immediately to go back to Eretz Yisrael, come what may. You know, immediately she's going to get up and change. There's a beautiful thing I heard on the Betelchen hotline many years ago that, um, you know, a lot of times when, you know, when we do something wrong, you can stick with the hard feelings and it could keep you in a vicious spiral downward where you can't get out of it. Somebody once did a horrific sin and he went to Rav Nassim Vachvogel's at Sal to ask him, what should I do for repentance? I want to correct myself. What should I do to fix myself up? So Rav Nassim Vachvogel said to him, come back to me, Yom Kippur. Don't think about it. It's so horrific. Keep going. Just keep going. And he, he kept asking him, what do I do? What are you, even Arab Yom Kippur, even Elul, all the, as, as Yom Kippur said, closing, he was freaking out, uh, fearing his sin. And then Yom Kippur, he says, Hashem wipes out all your sins and you have to, Forget about it. If you do tshuva with your whole heart, Hashem wipes away the slate. We have to believe that. And um, we have to keep going. And today's generation, especially, if we get too involved with sin and thinking about it too much, it really is a Yetzirah and we won't change. And the main thing is to change. That's the main thing of tshuva. Now, so Nomi tells her, son, her daughters, Lechna, Shovna, she's trying to dissuade them we're supposed to dissuade it. We learned from Megillus Rus, you're supposed to dissuade a con for three times. That's why they have at least three appointments with the Basin. And they don't dissuade them and say, go away. They just tell them, okay, come back again. You know, like we're not going to accept you right away. 
but um, you know, it says go, it, it, the um, she, she says, you know, why don't you go back and um, oh, I let no wonder I skipped the verse. Okay, Pasuk Zion, chapter uh, verse seven. Um, but Tetsi she left the place. But means she was a tzedekis. She was a holy woman because says by Yetzay Yaakov, when a tzaddik leaves, the place changes. You know, a tzaddik's leaving a place makes a huge impression on the place. And she went with her two daughters along. They batilachna baderech. They walked on the path. Um, you know, it really means in the path in Hebrew, not on top of the path, but in. What does it mean? In. We see from this that she didn't have proper shoes. Either her shoes were all torn. Or she had no shoes, barefoot. That's this woman that, you know, whatever, walk, she would come back to go to Eretz, even if it was painful. This is a way for her to correct for the previous sin of leaving Eretz Yisrael. She had to come back with pain. It also says, Ain Eretz Yisrael, Nikneis Elabi Yisurim. The only way you can acquire Eretz Yisrael is to sometimes have to go certain kind of, to forgo certain physical ple pleasures and sacrifices. Here, two princesses are leaving barefoot, going back to Eretz Yisrael. So now uh, she says, Lech Shovna, three, she's going to tell him, we're going to see three expressions of leaving. Go back, go back to your mother's house. Hashem will do you chesed like you did with the, the dead and with me. Some people say they paid for the funeral. No, we didn't, couldn't even afford the funeral of her sons. They had to pay for their own husband's funeral. So, um, so the, uh, or lechna shovna means it could also mean dissuading the convert. Like if she's a, if they were converted on, um, how do you say? You're either dissuading the convert because they were converted, and you're still checking it out. Now here is extreme circumstances. Are you still going to go retroactively back and keep your Judaism or not? Or it means that they were actually non-Jews and she had to dissuade them. So what happens? She tells him pasuk test. God should give you, and you're going to find menucha in the house of your husband. It says a woman does ankaras ruach isha. A woman does not have peace of mind. Ella base bala, except for the house of her husband. A woman does not have peace of mind unless she's in her husband's house. So um, we find that um, you know the, you should go find Manucha. You're not going to. Who says you're going to get married? At that point, no one knew that a Moabite woman was accepted as a convert. You may never be able to get married. Um, yeah, look, you're coming across penniless. You don't have any connections. Who says you guys are ever going to get married? You should go back home where you'll find a husband. And she kisses them. And now, even if they were non-Jews, they, they did her favors. We're supposed to be, you know, people think I could kiss a non-Jew. There's nothing wrong with a person showing appreciation for what they did to her. Um, because, you know, you'll have no, you'll have no one to marry an Eretz Yisrael. Now, and there's no Yibum, there's no one to marry that you can connect with the family that she knew of because they were Moabite women. Who knows if they're will be accepted? So you'll have no you'll have nothing. So they they started crying. Either they cried because the memory of their husband still was with them, or they cried because um, the thought of leaving her. And then she then she goes further. They're not the first time she dissuades them, no ki takna shu, we'll go with you. She tells them, my, my daughter, second time, go back, my daughters. Why are you going with me? Do you think I, I, I'm pregnant with children and, and this, they're going to be for you for husbands? The third time, return my daughters. I'm too old to conceive. Don't, I don't even have a hope. Even if I was tonight married, and even if I had children, Berna. We're going, to, we're going to wait for them to Saberna. I'm sorry. I just share you dollar until they get older. Halahenta Agena. You're going to really wait for them. The Vilti Osla Ish. Albanosai. Kimarli Maod Mikem. Things are very bitter from you. It could mean because my son's married out of the faith. That's why my life is hard. Kiyatsa Biyat Hashem. I'm being punished by Hashem. Or it could mean Marli um, Maod Mikem. I have it harder than you. You know, I did something wrong and you're not at fault, but I did something wrong and I'm being punished. So then they cried. Orpa kisses her mother and Rus clings to her mother. Now, what's the point? Um, Marami Prague says, Yavo b'nei hanashuka, 
V'yiplu b'day b'nei hadvuka. The daughters of the ones that kissed will fall in the hands of the ones that clung. Orpa has a grandson. Orpa that night leaves her mother-in-law. They say that night she lived with a hundred men and a dog. That's how far she descended. And Rus clung to her. And what happens? Orpa's grandson is Goliath, Goliath. And Rus, great-grandson, is King David. Uh, right. Oved, Yishai, and David. Right. Great-grandson is David. Now, the, and by the way, Rus lived to see Shlomo on the throne. That's how long she lived. But in any case, so she kisses her, and it says, the one that kissed will fall into the hands of the one that clung. What's so bad about kissing? Kissing shows, in fact, some love, regard for Yiddishkeit, some you know, regard for the Jewish people. What was so bad that she had to merit to have Goliath and that Rus uh, you know, is going to prevail over her? So I heard from Mordechai Miller Zetzal. I once heard him speak, and he said that when you kiss, that means you have an attachment to someone. And when you are attached to something and you had a positive feeling and then you make a choice to leave it, you are like leaving your conscience. You're leaving something you know to be right and you know to be the truth and you are consciously leaving it. That's really the lowest that you can get. Now, um, they said the reason she lowered herself so much that night is she felt that um, Chaim Shmulevis brings this down. Because when Nomi didn't accept her right, right away, you know, she didn't accept her conversion. She felt like she was like an animal. Like, I'm not being accepted by Nomi right away. Like, just come on in. And that she gave up already. Some people, you know, can't put up with any, the, the least amount of difficulties. So that shows retroactively that her conversion was not valid, even though the, according to those who said they were converted. Now, she walked, she accompanied Nomi 40 steps and that merit Goliath cursed out the Jews for 40 days. Also, there were four great people that came from, uh, four uh, leaders of Moab, Moabites, um, or Plishtim, uh, because she shed four tears, and because of that, she had four great people. So everything we do is not for naught. See, she was rewarded for the things she did do in this world, albeit, and there's nothing left in the next world, but you, God pays back everybody in exact payment, you know, either in this world or in the world to come. So then when she's left with just Rus, um, she tells her, your sister-in-law, your, your sister-in-law, but really was her sister, came back to her mother and to her God, go after your sister. In other words, you're going to be alone. You're going to regret that you're alone here. And maybe you'll be even more, you know, desiring of, of, of abandoning this stuff. She left. You're going to be all alone. You may never get married. Um, you know, uh, it says, and to her God, because usually once somebody leaves this situation, they're going to go back to another religion. And we tend to, the Rambam says, we tend to go after people. We follow people who we live with. So that's why she said, go back to your, your her, go back to your nation and to your God uh, and to her God, rather. The reason we're saying that is because once you live amongst certain people, you pick up their ways. Look what happened. They lived in Moab and they ended up marrying Moabite women. And then Rus tells her famous, beautiful words of Rus, which literally means don't harm me to lose, to leave you, to go from, a, from away from you, where you're going to go, I'll go, where you're going to live, I'm going to live. And where you're going to sleep, I'm going to sleep. Your nation is my nation and your God is my God. And then where you're going to die, I'm going to die. And then I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to be buried there. That's what Hashem is going to do. And that's what I'm going to continue to do because only death is going to separate me and you. Now, it's a lesson to be, there's a lot of lessons, but we're going to just pick one here. So here she um She's having this beautiful thing that she's going to say, uh, um, uh, you know, that I, I'm going to do all the things you're going to do now. So the um, it says really don't harm me. But according to some of the commentaries, she says, uh, well, the Al Sheikh is the one that says don't harm me. She felt if she's going to give up her Judaism, if she'll leave Judaism, she's going to her soul is going to suffer in this world and in the next. That's she says she's good. And according to some commentaries. 
could also mean to kill. You're going to murder my soul if you make me leave Judaism. That's how much attached she felt to Judaism. So that's something for us to learn about how, you know, we're supposed to love Hashem with all our heart, all our life, with every, even our soul. Even we have to give up our soul for God. This is a convert. And we're supposed to all be converts at all times. We're saying it daily in the Shema to love Hashem with all of our heart that everything should be for him. So she felt she's going to die if she doesn't keep all this. Now, we find um, this whole thing, this whole dialogue here of all these places that, um, interesting thing. So that it says, she's warning her, like we're supposed to warn a convert before they convert any convert to Judaism. When they're standing in the mikvah is warned by the based in all the things, are you still going to keep this? Are you still going to keep that? So she was asked the questions, um, where you go, I will go. She says, you know, we don't go to circuses and theaters. Now, what does that mean? Let me just skip this place for a second. Um, yeah, it says, Bechuko seim lo seilechu, in Parshas Achremos. So what is Bechuko seim lo seilechu? That, um, that uh, you know, that you're not supposed to follow the ways of the non-Jews. So it says, Tartios et stadios, you're not supposed to go to their stadiums and their theaters and their places of amusement. You're not supposed to go. That's what, according to one commentary, that's what she was warned. She says, no, I'm not even going to do that. I'm going to have a uniquely Jewish life. And then they say, um, you can't wear, wear, you only can sleep with a mezuzah or you, can, or you can't sleep alone with a man. She says, I know, I'm going to sleep how you sleep. And she says, amei chami. There's a lot of other mitzvahs, all the Jews have to keep. I'm going to do every mitzvah Jew does. And I'm going to, and I'm going to, you know, and, and Shama Kaver, I'll even die like a Jew, a righteous Jew. Now, the question asked is, the first one about, you know, you're not supposed to go like a Gentile. It is a law in the Torah. You're not supposed to just, we are supposed to have a Jewish approach to life. We're not supposed to be just like any Gentile. We are supposed to be, we're not supposed to be like a non-Jew with a yarmulke on our head. We have certain things, you know, certain things in common, but we're supposed to have uniquely Jewish music, uniquely Jewish events to just be like everybody else. That's so crazy to, you know, <laughs> um, in <laughs> One thing that bothers me personally is this like Super Bowl Sunday, you know, like even in the Jewish caterers, they are giving out special wings or whatever it is that people have when they're watching the Super Bowl. Like, you know, has that become like a Jewish festival or do we supposed to eat like Gentiles? Are we supposed to like have all the food and all this is not a Jewish kind of, you know, environment for ourselves. We have to be uniquely Jewish. And she says, I'm keeping that as well as the regular commandments that are expected of a Jew. That, you know, I realize I have to have a different type of life. We have a different focus on our life that we're not, you know, and I'm not criticizing with people with the, the Super Bowl Sunday, people come from different backgrounds and depends what they're exposed to. I'm just saying that it's not to be associated with Judaism that we have the Jewish catering for the Super Bowl Sunday. Now, and anyways, the, um, okay, so she says, I'm going to, so that was, that was, she's accepted that. Batera ki misa metzas hilalechas. She saw she's struggling to walk. It says a Jewish person, a Jewish, it says that the Vilna Gaon says that when you do a mitzvah and everything goes super easy and your legs are just like carrying you and you're flying, beware, it's likely your Yetzer Hara, that there may be some part in there that you're invested in. When you're, when you're trying to do mitzvah and you feel like there's certain resistance, you should know that it's your Yetzer Atob that's pushing you to do this mitzvah. And we find this, that, you know, often um, it says the Talmud Chachamim are weaker than regular men because Torah weakens a person because your physicality is not what's important. It's your spiritual. Now, not that all Talmud Chachamim are weak, but many are because, um, you know, it's a further test to see if he's going to keep going with his learning and everything, even though it's, uh, he sees he's not of such strong constitution. So when she sees that she's struggling, then she stopped. She felt she did her part. She gave her the three warnings. She told her all the things that involve Judaism. And she sees she's, she's doing it wholeheartedly, but not coming easy. You know, they say, how do you know if you finally arrived as a Balchuva or as a convert when things come hard to you? 
in the beginning, everything's, oh, it's my first Pesach, it's my first Rosh Hashanah, or my first davening. And when things start becoming stale, then you know you're really in it for the right reasons. And then you have to push yourself. You have to fight. Now you know your yates are tov, and it's a boost, and you have to keep fighting it and pushing it. Now, the uh, and Pasuk Yates, and we're almost going to be finished within five minutes. Uh, I know I have to go longer, but there's three hours is going to be just barely making it for this class. So they both walked together. We're told by the commentary she was equally on the footing with her mother-in-law as far as being a righteous Jew until they came to Beis Lechem. Now, she still had to under, if, if she was not converted, that's not enough. She's still going to have to go to a basement. But if she was converted, then this, this clinches it, you know? Um, now, they went to Beis Lechem. They returned to the very place she left. They can imagine the embarrassment. Nomi has to come home. When they came back to Beis Lechem, the whole city was in a, an uproar. They were all, you know, and Vatomarna, this is feminine. Uh, this verb is in the feminine. And they said, the female said, because if a woman comes, men were not looking at the women. Now, why did the whole city, why were they all in a turmoil? Um, the reason being, something happened that day, different, three different opinions. Either that was the day that was a funeral of Boaz's first wife, and the whole city came out in respect for him, because he was the greatest rabbi of the time. Some people say he was Ivtan. Um, other people say that there was a night of cutting down the Omer and everyone came for the ceremony. Or the third possibility is that he married off children on that night and people were there for the wedding. But whatever it was, um, everyone was there and the women noticed that Tomarna and they said, Hazos Naomi, is this Naomi? This is the woman that her earrings matched, her necklace matched, her shoes matched, her purse. And everything was Gucci. Now, probably quiet Gucci, but whatever it was, she was wearing fine wool garments and everything as, as, her, as her stature in life. And a person should dress nicely for her husband, you know, especially for her husband. You know, um, a lot of people, when it comes to being at home, eh, you know, and then when they go out at the weddings, you know, but um, here she's coming and she's barefoot or whatever she is. And they said, this is Nomi wearing rags. And, and she was also, her face reflected all the suffering that she had undergone. They couldn't believe it. This is her worst moment. And she told them, now she could have responded, Rabbi Brevda, she could have told them off, is this how you talk to an almana? She didn't say a word. She accepted it. And she says, don't call me Nomi. Don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara. Now it's with an Aleph, so it's minimal. Mara means bitter, but not so bitter with a hey. But all things like slightly bitter. Kihemar Shakaili, because God made me, made it bitter for me, very bitter for me. Now God is called here Shakai, Shadai. Um, why is he called this name? Dai means like Dayenu, enough. This name, whenever we use that name of God, it means God put limits in creation. I believe with perfect faith. She's saying I'm exacting. I'm being meted out punishment, punishment, listen to this meted in English, mida, measured. See, it comes from a lot of the language in the world is from the original Hebrew. The world was created with Hebrew. Anyways, God meted out my punishment precisely. He gave me exact, I deserve this. That's how she, she accepted upon herself what happened. And this Rebrevda said, and, um, and he said, I, I, I came out full and Hashem gave me empty. Why are you calling me Naomi? And Hashem afflicted me, but he's giving me exact punishment and it's not forever. That means there's limits. It's not unlimited. There's either going to be, it, it helps me, it'll atone for my sins. I'll get the world to come or it's not going to be forever in this world. We don't know. God does not want to afflict someone forever. Now, interesting. I just want to, I'm almost done really. <laughs> I just wanted to say a beautiful, this looks like the worst moment in history, but this is how the Yeshua is beginning. Now it says, I praise you Hashem for afflicting me to some Hallel. And it became for me, my redemption, this worst moment of embarrassment and eating crow and seeing now that she was the, the, supposed to give all these people money and she gave nobody anything. And now she has nothing with a Moabite girl ac accompanying her. You know, um, it, you know, she, she really accepted it. Something interesting, you know, 
they said, is this Naomi? Okay, now it wasn't the right thing to say. Rav Victor Miller tells us that Sal, you know, we're told by the Talmud, but we don't pay attention sometimes. It says, hurting someone with words, onas devarim, is worse than hurting them financially. Now, when you talk about the term onas mamon, hurting someone financially, you know what that means? Onaa. Ona in Hebrew means cheating. What would you think of someone that cheated somebody financially? You think despicable, dishonest, creep. I'm not going to his store again. A cheater or politicians. What can we do? We're stuck with them. <laughs> but onas devarim is worse, says the Gemara. It says it's worse to hurt somebody with words than it is to hurt him with money because money only hurts his pocket, but words can hurt somebody forever. Victor Miller said he had five students that, in, that either insulted him or embarrassed him. I don't remember. And he said he never forgot who they were and he never forgot who they said, what they said, even though he forgave them wholeheartedly because you're, you're supposed to forgive people and try to not bear a grudge. It's a Torah prohibition. He never forgot who it was. We don't know if be so careful with our words not to afflict another person. And so thus ends the first chapter of Megillus Rus. We will get next week. Don't miss it. It's the exciting threshing floor encounter between Boaz and Rus. And um, hopefully we'll see you next week. I wish you all a wonderful lot of Omer. I'll just conclude with this thought. And that is Rav Shimon Bar Yochai says, I mean, Rabbi Gamil Rabinovich Shlita says about Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. Rav Shimon Bar Yochai would have been a regular, okay, very holy Tana. But what made him unique? That 13 years he suffered alone in a cave. He said skin afflictions from burying himself in sand during the week when he learned Torah. And he suffered, he didn't eat so much and he didn't see people and only Torah for 13 years. That's quite, you know, and left his family. And um, we find that this is what made him into Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. Afflictions can make a person. We don't know, but afflictions do help us and they help us bring the Yeshua. So when we're going through something, let's look at it as temporary, as meted out perfectly and it's going to bring us to our place. And we learned some things about conversions here and the different consequences and how much we have to love Hashem and how much we have to be willing to sacrifice for that and how we shouldn't be stingy people. I thank you all for listening. Thank you, Eli Sheva, for your great monitor mentoring us. And um, let us turn off the tape.